New from MyProtein, the protein shake that changes the game. Way Forward is better for the planet and fuels maximum performance. It's time for change. It's time for the Way Forward. When I competed in bodybuilding, starting in the early 60s and, all, and into the 70s, the choice of food supplements was minimal. Uh, the popular supplements back then included desiccated liver tablets, which are basically dried liver tablets in concentrated form. They take, li they take liver, they remove all the water, and they kind of concentrate it into a tablet or a powder. They had something called brewer's yeast. That was one of the first supplements I ever took. Uh, brewer's yeast basically was a good source of B-complex vitamins, and it had something that was then called the glucose tolerance factor because it, same, it seemed to have the ability to allow you to utilize glucose better. Uh, very, you know, very good for supposedly preventing diabetes and all that. Well, that turned out to be a chromium niacin complex. And uh, ye this brewer's yeast is still one of the best sources of chromium to this day. It didn't taste very good, but it was a good so fairly good source of B-complex vitamins. It didn't have a lot, but it had more than most other foods. Uh, then you had your normal vitamin C, vitamin E, that type of thing. But the point being here that you didn't have a lot of the exotic supplements that are available today. I mean, you have today you have all kinds of things. You have pre-workout supplements. Of course, you have the various protein powders, whey protein, and more recently you have the veg, ve, you know, the vegetable-based uh, proteins, pea protein, hemp protein, uh, soy protein's been around. Well, soy protein's been around for many years. In fact, soy protein did exist years ago when I uh, when I was involved when I first got into bodybuilding. Soy protein was pro was actually the most prevalent uh, protein powder, and you had some uh, milk and egg protein powders which were you know, not that great. I mean, uh, one of them was called Blair's Protein, which was popularized uh, by a couple of top bodybuilders in the 60s. Larry Scott, the first Mr. Olympia, a couple other guys. Uh, Blair's Protein was 62% protein. Uh, uh, it was a milk and egg protein. Uh, and I'll tell you, it uh, it tasted very good. Uh, especially if you he uh, Blair sold a coconut extract uh, uh, that you can add to the protein and when you and he also advised uh, that you if you were trying to put muscle size on you would mix it uh, with heavy cream so i would throw in the blast protein heavy cream coconut extract put it in a blender and it mixed so thick that it had the consistency of ice cream i mean you couldn't drink it you had to eat it with a spoon but i'll tell you even after all these years i could still remember the taste and it was incredibly delicious. I mean, to me, it tasted better than any ice cream I ever ate. And I wound up overeating too much. And I wasn't thinking about all that heavy cream that I was putting in there. It added up to a lot of calories. And unfortunately, I wound up putting on a pretty good amount of fat because I was having about six of those heavy cream drinks a day. And that was better for like skinny guys with high metabolism. That wasn't, I wasn't in that category. But anyway, you know, live and learn, as they say. But today, as I said, you have a, a, a literally a plethora of all these various so-called sports supplements. Um, a lot of them are aimed at bodybuilders. Some of them come and go and this and that, but they're all heavily advertised. There's a lot of claims and hyperbole surrounding them. Uh, you know, you build tons of muscle, and then you got the testosterone boosters, which I've discussed in previous videos which uh, the, with the testosterone boosters, 99.9% .9 of them don't work. They're like a complete waste of money. Uh, they, there's a couple of them, however. There's a couple of herbal ones like Long Jack, also known as Concat Ali, that does have a slight uh, effect at raising testosterone. That might be of use in uh, either younger men with uh, naturally low testosterone levels or in older men who are showing lower testosterone levels. That could be a useful testosterone booster. But most of the other ones are garbage. Uh, they don't do anything. Uh, they, they did have this, the, uh, the testosterone boosters of about, uh, what was it, maybe um, 20 years ago, close to 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So the, the last group uh, actually were uh, anabolic steroids that were never really produced or released to the market. 
uh, they were just uh, in these uh, these esoteric uh, anabolic steroid formula books. In other words, the structural formula. And a couple of uh, people with a little bit of a background in chemistry had these old books, and they you know they reintroduced these old discarded steroids, and they called them testosterone boosters. And yes, they did really work. They really did work because they were anabolic steroids. And there's a reason why they were never released on the market. The reason they were never released on the market was two reasons. First of all, they weren't shown to be any better than existing anabolic steroids. But the main reason was because animal studies showed that they had increased toxicity, especially in the liver. A lot of them almost immediately caused severe liver problems. And this is exactly what happened to a lot of the hapless people that bought the so-called testosterone boosters in the hopes of building big muscles. And, uh, you know, they did make you stronger. I mean, they were real anabolic steroids, but they always, almost always caused side effects. If you were lucky, when you got off them, the side effects were to recede, just like they do with anabolic steroids, and you'd be okay. If you were unlucky, you could get uh, effects such as liver failure and all kinds of terrible things, possibly even liver cancer in very rare cases. But what I wanted to talk about today, this is going to be a two-part video. And the first part, this part, part one, I'm going to talk about what science calls effective sports supplements. In other words, these are sports supplements that are recognized uh, as having a good body of research to show that they actually do something. But I think there's some caveats in order here before I talk about some of these things uh, in, in the sense that while some of these supplements that I'm talking about here do have a pretty good body of science behind them, meaning they have some studies showing, and human studies, not just animal studies, but human studies showing that they work, uh, what, uh, what I found and what subsequent studies showed about some of these substances or supplements is that they work better on paper, unfortunately, than they do in reality. Uh, you know, I'll talk about uh, one of them in particular. Uh, but uh, so let, let's start it off um, right now. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is the, the supplements that I'm going to talk about here uh, are recognized by most scientists as being effective sports supplement uh, sources. Uh, but they may or may not work for you. That's the thing. Just because a couple of studies found that they worked well, they may not work at all for you for various reasons. But anyway, let's start off. The first one I want to talk about, just about everybody knows, not really a supplement. It's more like a kind of natural drug, and that's caffeine. Uh, caffeine happens to be, well, you know, for, this, for the purpose of this video, I'm going to call it a sports supplement only because it's found in so many pre-workout formulas, energy formulas, uh, fat burners. Uh, they, they all contain caffeine in one form or another. So because it's in so many supplements, I'm going to call it a, a supplement, even though it's more of a drug. Uh, it's an, Of course, it is a natural substance. It's, it's uh, from a plant. Uh, you know, coffee, of course, contains caffeine. Tea contains caffeine to a lesser extent. But caffeine is, is, happens to be a really effective sports supplement. The studies show that if you ingest a dose of zero, a minimal dose, I should say, uh, 0.3 milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight, it will definitely uh, usually help increase uh, workout efficiency, it'll increase workout intensity, and it'll increase uh, strength. Now, not all studies agree with that. Some studies have found almost no effect, but the majority of studies show that caffeine works. However, uh, the higher the dose, up to a point, the greater the effect on strength and training intensity with caffeine. So what that means in practical terms is the uh, maximal effective, let's call it ergogenic dose of caffeine is 0.6 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. That's equivalent for a, a guy weighing about 190, 200 pounds. That's equivalent to about four cups of coffee. Uh, if you want to have the best, uh, er, if you want to use coffee rather than supplements as your source of caffeine, you want to ingest it ab at least about an hour before you work out 
because coffee or caffeine, I should say, peaks in an hour after oral ingestion. And another thing to keep in mind is caffeine, once you've ingested it, it peaks in an hour and it stays pretty uh, elevated for about another hour, uh, but it still stays in the blood for up to six hours. What that means, again, is if you take caffeine too late, let's say you take it before an evening workout, the stimulatory effect of caffeine might interfere with sleep. So that's something to keep in mind. Caffeine's probably best used, or coffee, if you drink coffee, it's best used earlier in the day so it doesn't interfere with sleep. Uh, caffeine exerts its ergogenic effects through various mechanisms. Probably the main one is it stimulates the release of body chemicals called catecholamines. Specifically, in this case, we're talking about epinephrine and norepinephrine. Dopamine is also considered a, a uh, catecholamine, but that's not really involved in what I'm talking about here. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are known to stimulate an enzyme in fat cells called hormone-sensitive lipase that causes the uh, release of fats or triglycerides stored in fat cells. It breaks up the stored triglyceride into its component of fatty acids and glycerol, which then enter the blood and they could be used as an energy source. Glycerol can be turned in, in the, it can be converted in the liver into glucose, which is the main uh, energy source in the blood. Uh, uh, but anyway, the point being that um, uh, uh, the stimulatory effects of caffeine uh, occur, it's thought to occur because it's very, uh, caffeine is structurally similar to a relaxing compound called adenosine. Adenosine is involved in onset of sleep. It's a relaxation chemical. And, and what happens is uh, adenosine can make you feel a little tired, uh, a little, little too relaxed, and you don't want that before you work out. So if you drink caffeine, this is why people like to drink coffee in the morning, because adenosine builds up during the night, because as I said, it's involved in the sleep process. So you take your caffeine or coffee in the morning, uh, the, because of the similarity of caffeine to adenosine, the caffeine will kind of block adenosine receptors in the brain. Therefore, it'll kind of blunt the effect of adenosine in producing a, 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 a feeling of tiredness and relaxation, and it'll make you feel alert. That's the mechanism. That's the stimulatory mechanism. Now, on the flip side, the problem with, uh, with uh, blocking adenosine, uh, and there's, I think, at least two types of adenosine receptors, but one of the uh, adenosine also works in the heart, when, you, when you're working out, uh, the coronary arteries which serve the heart, they dilate to, to get blood you know, into the heart so that the heart can work more efficiently. Unfortunately, if you drink a, a lot of caffeine or a lot of coffee before you train, you not only block adenosine in the brain, you block adenosine in the, in the coronary arteries, which means that the coronary arteries, uh, arteries are gonna have a more difficult time dilating, which means that the heart might maybe not be getting an optimal blood supply. Now, for people with normal heart function who don't have cardiovascular uh, pathology existing or existing cardiovascular pathology, you're not going to notice anything, nothing's going to be a problem. However, if you have any kind of, let's say, uh, severe atherosclerosis, which is a narrowing of the coronary arteries, or if you have some sort of occult, meaning that you don't know you have it, cardiovascular disease, to drinking a large amount or taking a large amount of caffeine before you work out, you know, because of this effect on the coronary artery dilation, it could actually prove very dangerous. I mean, in a worst case scenario, uh, it can make you drop dead. Now, that's very rare, admittedly, but it's just something to think about. And I should also point out that uh, the greatest source of caffeine in most people, for most people, or most bodybuilders, let's say, or athletes, is not necessarily coffee, but a lot of it comes from, like I said, the fat burner supplements, and a lot of the pre-workout uh, uh, supplements contain a considerable, considerable amount of caffeine. Some of them contain the amount of caffeine equivalent to up to four, maybe five cups of coffee. Now, so if you, let's say you take, uh, you know, you, you uh, buy one of these pre-workout powders, and you say, well, it, and, and the directions are to take one scoop, and you decide, well, I'm going to take two scoops because I really want to get jacked for the workout. Unfortunately, if you take the two scoops and it's a high caffeine formula, you could be taking as much as uh, the equivalent of, of eight cups of coffee at once. 
Now, that's way past the, ergoge the maximal erg ergogenic benefit of caffeine. So you can have what they call an ergolytic benefit. In other words, an interference with workout. And worst of all, you'll be putting a, a, a good amount of strain on your heart. So, you know, you got to be careful of that. So that's all I'll say. So caffeine, that's the first sports supplement. And again, it's, you know, I know it's not really a supplement, but it's always in all the supplement formulas. But caffeine definitely, I would say, is a definite uh, effective supplement. The next one that's a, that most uh, researchers agree, the majority of researchers agree, is an effective supplement, is creatine. Now, creatine, uh, the original creatine was creatine monohydrate. Monohydrate just means water. So creatine monohydrate is 99% creatine. Well, it's actually 87% creatine, and the rest of it is something else, and 1% of it is water. Uh, so it's, it's mostly cre uh, uh, creatine. Now, I'm not going to go into all the nuances of creatine, but let me put it this way. Uh, creatine works for 80% of the people that use it. Uh, it's been studied for now about 25, 30 years, <clears throat> and the consensus is that it works for 80% of people who use it. Uh, and uh, the, the, the main uh, function of creatine is to act as a backup for ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the immediate source of energy for cells. Uh, and everything you eat as far as calories, protein, fat, carbohydrate, they eventually are converted into a ATP, because that, as I said, that's the elemental energy source for all cells. Unfortunately, a the energy that's released from ATP, and the energy is released when ATP has three phosphate bonds, when one of them breaks off, that, that's your energy. It produces an energy reaction. So now you have adenosine diphosphate. Now you have creatine is stored in the muscle as both free creatine and creatine phosphate. Mostly as creatine phosphate. When the, aden when the ATP is degraded into, into ADP, uh, the, the creatine phosphate contributes a phosphate to regenerate the ADP back to ATP and it keeps the energy system going. So that so you could say that creatine keeps your muscles supplied with energy for muscle contraction. It does a number of other things. It apparently stimulates intramuscular insulin like growth factor one, which is anabolic direct anabolic effect. It also acts as a buffer. It helps to uh, reduce acidity in muscle, which is a big factor for fatigue. Uh, I'm not going to, again, I've discussed creatine in many other videos. In my Applied Metabolics newsletter, I've had several articles on creatine. As new research comes out about creatine, I write about it. So I'm not going to go into detail about uh, more about creatine here, other than to say it is a definitely, a, a, without question, I would say the number one eff effective sports supplement, number one. Next one I'm going to talk about is nitrates. Nitrates are substances that are found in uh, naturally in uh, green leafy vegetables and in uh, especially beets, beetroot juice is a great source of natural nitrates. And what happens there is when you consume these vegetables like spinach or beetroot juice, you get what they call nitrates. Uh, the first step uh, uh, occurs in your mouth. Some of the bacteria in your mouth uh, produce enzymes that start to convert nitrate into nitrite. And, and as you swallow the, nitri the, uh, the, the, uh, the nitrate, the, uh, further enzymes in the gut convert the, what is now nitrite into nitric acid. So now you have an increase of nitric acid. So this is a good way of getting the benefits of nitric oxide without having to take, let's say, nit nitric oxide booster supplements, arginine, which is not really that effective for boosting nitric oxide. Um, I, could, I don't want to get into that. I talked about that again in Applied Metabolics. I, uh, but d suffice to say that uh, this uh, nitrite, nitrate system from vegetables is pretty effective. <coughs> uh, it, um, it bypasses all the problems involved with amino acids like arginine. Uh, and uh, the thing is, uh, the thing to remember about this is that it takes about maybe two to two and a half hours from the time you consume the, the nitrate containing vegetable to the conversion in the gut into nitric oxide. You gotta give it about two hours. So let's say you wanna drink beetroot juice. 
you're going to do that about two hours or no no more no less than one hour before a workout if you want to get the benefits of nitric oxide increase which includes dilation of blood vessels you get a greater muscle pump greater delivery of oxygen to muscles uh, and so on and so forth again I, I've talked about this in depth uh, in my applied meta I just wanted to talk about it here uh, I'm going to go to a third uh, uh, supplement here and then I'm going to end it for this is part one because I see I'm at the 20 minute mark already I'm going to talk briefly about beta alanine beta alanine uh, I actually just did an article just completed an article on my in my applied metabolics won't be out for a couple of months on how to optimize beta alanine supplementation uh, beta alanine briefly is a supplement that when combined with another amino acid called histidine forms what they call a dipeptide that that dipeptide is called carnosine. Carnosine represents 8% of intramuscular buffer, meaning in the muscle, it buffers those acids I talk about that accumulate during anaerobic exercise. And when the acidity in muscle increases, it inhibits energy-producing enzymes, so the muscle basically stops working. Cause, and that's muscle fatigue. This is only one cause of muscle fatigue, this acidity. There's other causes, such as an increase of inorganic phosphate. I'm not going to get into that. Way too complex here. But the point being, beta alanine works by, uh, by, by increasing the production of, of carnosine. Uh, you can increase carnosine as, uh, anywhere from 20 to 60% with beta alanine supplementation. The optimal dose range is 3.2 to 6.4%. Uh, grams uh, a day. Uh, there's the one side effect of beta alanine. It's called paresthesia. Uh, when you take beta alanine, the dose is larger than uh, uh, about 800 milligrams. It stimulates sensory neurons in the skin. Kind of feels a little bit like the niacin flush effect, but a little bit different. Uh, it starts to subside with just like niacin. It starts to subside with continued use of beta alanine. Uh, beta alanine, uh, uh, like I say, it's it's pretty effective. My experience of beta alanine, as I mentioned in my article, is I found that the lower dose, 3.2 grams, uh, didn't do much for me. But when I went to 6.4, I, I noticed an increase in muscle endurance to the extent uh, when I was working out, I would do a set, and I felt like I was ready to do a set, another set, about four seconds later. In other words, I had no sense of fatigue at all. I, I felt like I can just keep going, like one big set. There was no fatigue whatsoever. Uh, so that's what beta alanine does. There are problems with beta alanine, which I, I'm not going to get into here. I discussed it in my article. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to stop now with the beta alanine. In my next video, I'm going to discuss a couple of other supplements that are recognized by scientists, research scientists, as being effective sports supplements. Uh, so stay tuned for uh, that'll be the, the next video uh, but if you want further information about nutrition exercise science ergogenic aids hormonal therapy anti-aging research you can use today effective fat loss techniques um, uh, women's health and fitness uh, all of these topics and more are covered in my applied metabolics newsletter www.appliedmetabolics.com it's it's anywhere from 30 to 50 pages every month no ads i'm not trying i'm not associated with any supplement company so i won't be pushing any supplements on you like all these other publications and websites do i'm just giving you hard true factual information no bs that includes my six decades that's 60 years of constant study and experience which i don't know anyone who could really match that most of the people who can match that are already dead. <laughs> and you're not going to get much information from them. Anyway, <laughs> so it, when you subscribe, I'll send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page, where each day I post new information on nutrition, exercise science, general medicine. But you have to be a subscriber to get that invitation. I have an email portal on my Applied Metabolics website which is exclusively for, again, current subscribers of Applied Metabolics. They could send me short questions on anything that they might have read in Applied Metabolics or any other thing that, uh, they, that interests them that they may, maybe I can help them answer. But that, again, is a, a service extended only to my current subscribers of Applied Metabolics. I only have a limited amount of time, and I'm going to give that time to the people that are subscribers, current subscribers. 
Uh, and that's about it. If you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter and adopt a dog. Thank you for listening. Thank you.